So, um, hot flashes are the most common brain symptom of the menopause transition, and as I said, you know, for most women, sleep um, becomes a part of that problem, although to a variable extent. Some people really don't have major sleep problems, and some people do. Um, mood disturbance or depressive um, is fortunately less common as a, a manifestation of the menopause transition. Uh, and when it does occur, it's usually more on the mild side. It's usually not a major depression or a clinical depression that comes to a level of severity and concern that we would have an urgency to intervene. Um, that being said, the mild symptoms, because they do last, can last for a very long time, and people don't feel like themselves. You know, they feel like they're not responding to interactions the way they normally would. Um, you know, they, they do warrant attention, and many people do suffer through them, but they are, they are um, treatable and they can be managed. Um, our work has shown, that this is the work I'm going to be presenting later today, that key factors that contribute to the mood problem are having nighttime hot flashes and having the sleep disruption not having daytime hot flashes. So some people used to think that people were moody just because they were annoyed and bothered during the day, and our research would suggest that's not the case, that it's the nighttime hot flashes and, separately, the, the sleep problem. So I tell women, you know, if they're having mood problems, you know, they don't, people don't have to have hot flashes treated if they're not bothering them too much, but for somebody who's having mood problems, who's sad, who doesn't respond, who might be irritable, who isn't interacting the way she normally would, that she should really get her sleep and hot flashes at night under control as part of that treatment. Um, this is, again, research that validates that there's a biological basis for these symptoms. These are brain's response to the hormone changes and the symptom manifestations of those hormone changes. And the treatments are, you know, available and important options, including the same ones we talked about um, for hot flashes, which can include both estrogen-based therapies and also uh, serotonin-based therapies. So there's there's several sort of important next steps. So one is, you know, we're now over 10 years out from the results of the Women's Health Initiative re reports. And those results made everybody very scared about using um, estrogen therapy um, at all. And the, the Women's Health Results were not initiative, uh, was not about studying symptom management. It was about health, a healthy postmenopausal women, mostly years from their final menstrual period, and looking at uh, prevention uh, risk factors. So we are now doing um, analyses that are breaking out the um, risks of using estrogen by age and proximity to the menopause transition. And there's some other recent results from a study called KEEPS that um, was in the peri and early postmenopausal population. And essentially, there's a lot more information we have now showing that the population that um, seems to have the safest response um, to estrogen therapy is this young recently postmenopausal or perimenopausal population. And I think there's some really important um, work going on to try and separate that out. Um, one of the other things that people are now understanding is that, yes, there are risks with estrogen in whatever age group or time from menopause, um, but when you're weighing those risks against the benefits of symptom control and symptom management, you know, oftentimes you err on the side of of treatment because people are really suffering and distressed. Um, so that I think is really an important time and the pendulum is shifting a little bit more to be more nuanced about how to think about um, estrogen use in this population. Um, some of the other work I think is really important is to understand you know, what are the health consequences um, of us having untreated symptoms. You know, For women who don't sleep, um, for women who um, have hot flashes or, or the mood symptoms, you know, are, are there health consequences that should make us think, you know, yes, it's a quality of life symptom, but actually it may be really important to treat. And one example I'll give you that we know from other populations is that we know that sleep deprivation can cause a lot of metabolic changes, um, appetite changes that lead people to eat more and eat the things that lead to weight gain. And this has to do with some of the um, changes in adiponectins and uh, leptin and uh, metabolic hormones and hormones that are promote appetite. 
So one of the you know important concepts is you know what about midlife sleep and what are some of the potential consequences for metabolism for weight changes, which is you know important correlates with cardiovascular outcomes, metabolic disease, diabetes, and so forth.